couldn't find it? Nah, but I saw Miss Maggie. She called me Chris again. I'm telling you, dude. Just be glad you're never at, seen her at night. We both laughed and she asked if she invited me in for a snack. Joking that the snacks must be terrible since she couldn't even give them away. I told him that she didn't even fought and he was surprised. And now that I had time to think about it, and it's so I was literally, every time we had seen her, she invited us in for snacks and sat there I had a bit sarcastically invited myself and she said no. As Josh talked about this Miss Maggie, I suddenly realized that the lighter might still be in my pocket and that would be disastrous for my mom to find. I grabbed my shorts off the floor and patted my padded sock pockets. I felt something, but it wasn't the lighter. From my back pocket, I slid out the folded piece of paper. And my heart leapt. The map? I thought, but I watched it float away. As I unfolded the paper, my stomach turned as I began to understand what I was seeing. The drawn paper inside of a large oval were two stick figures holding hands. One was much bigger than the other. Neither had faces. The paper was torn apart away from it being missing, and there was a large number written near on top of the right corner. It was either 15 or 16. I nervously handed Josh the paper and asked him if he put it in my pocket at some point. He scoffed at the idea, and I asked why I was so upset. I pointed at the smaller stick figure, and it was written next to it. It was my initials. I shook it off and told Josh that the rest of the conversation between Miss Maggie and I had always a tribute to the old exchange for her being so sick, until revisiting the events in my mind after all these years later. As I think about it now, the feeling of the profound sadness for Miss Maggie returns, but it is still automated by a looming feeling of despair when I think about why she said, maybe some other time. I knew what she had said, but I didn't understand what it meant at night. I didn't understand what her words meant weeks later, until when I watched Men Strange. Orange biohazard suits carry what looked like a black bag full of garbage of her house, or why the whole neighborhood smelled like death that day. I still didn't understand why they condemned the house and boarded up, a little while out before we moved, but I understand now. I understand why her last words were so important, even either she or I realized at the time. Miss Maggie had just told me that night Tom had come home, but I know how and who really moved in, just as I know why I never saw her body throughout this on the stretcher. The bags weren't filled with garbage. I intentionally withheld some details a lot in my stories. I've let all hopes considering the way things might influence the evaluation of the way they actually were. I don't think that there was any point to that anymore. At the end of the summer between kindergarten and first grade, I caught the stomach flu. This has all been the components of the regular flu. However, with the stomach flu, you flew through up in a bucket and not in the toilet because you were sitting on it, and the sickness gets plurged in both ends. This lasted for about 10 days, but just before it had passed the sickness, it was granted extension from a form of a pink eye. My eyelids were so fused together by the dry mucus generated from the night that on the first day, I woke up with the infection and I thought I had gone blind. But when I started first grade, I had a kink in my neck from 10 days of bed rest and two swollen bloodshot eyes. Josh was in another group that I didn't have my lunch in, so in a cafeteria, bursted with 200 kids. I still had a table to myself. I started keeping spare food in my backpack that I would take to the bathroom to eat either after lunch since my school meals usually confiscated my older kids who knew that I wouldn't stand up to them since no one would stand with me. This dynamic persists even after my condition cleared up since no one wants to be friends with a kid who gets bullied. Let least they have some aggression directed that towards themselves. The only reason they was stopped due to the actions of a kid named Alex. Alex was in third grade and he was bigger than most of the kids in any other grade. Around the third week of school, he started sitting with me at lunch and he put his immediate end to the shortage of my food supply. He was nice though. He seemed to be kind of slow. We never really talked that 
length except for when I finally decided to ask him why he had been sitting with me. He had a crush on Josh's sister, Veronica. Veronica was in fourth grade and was probably the most prettiest girl in the school. Even as a six-year-old fully endorsed the notion that girls were disgusting, I knew how pretty Veronica was. When she was in third grade, Josh told me that two boys had actually gone into a physical fight, which erupted out of argument, concerning the significance of the messages that had written in their yearbooks. One of the boys eventually hit the other in the forehead with the corner of the yearbook, and the wound required stitches to close. While those were two boys, Alex waited did to her like him and confessed that Josh and I knew, knew we were best friends. I gathered for that he hoped that I would convey the obsequiously philanthropic deed to Veronica and that she would presumably be moved into the selflessness that she'd take interest in him. If I told her that he would continue to sit with me for as long as I needed him to. Because during this time, when Josh mostly stayed at the house building the raft and navigating the tributary with me, I didn't have the chance to bring up to Veronica because I simply didn't want to see her. I told Josh about it and he made fun of Alex, but he said that he would tell his sister since I wanted him to. I doubt that he would. Josh was annoyed that the people seemed to be taken with his sister. Remember calling him a, her an ugly crow? I never said anything that to Josh, but I do remember wanting to say, even then, she was pretty and that she would one day be beautiful. I was right. When I was 15, I was seeing a movie at my friend's place that I had come to call to the dirt and feed here. It was probably nice at some point, and some neglect had withered and to a place severely. This feeder had movable tables and chairs on the level floor, and when the feeder was full, there were pretty much a few places where you could sit down and watch seats the whole screen. The feeder was still open, I imagine for three reasons. One, it was cheap to see a movie there. Two, they showed a different cult movie twice a month at midnight and... And three... They sold beer to underage kids during the midnight showings. I went there for my first two, and the night that they were showing Scanners by David Cronenberg for about a dollar. My friend and I were sitting at the very back. I wanted to sit closer to the front for a better view, but Ryan had driven us, so I relented. A couple of minutes before the movie started, a group of girls walked in. They were all pretty attractive, but whatever beauty they might have allowed clips by the girl with the dirty blonde hair, even though I caught only a glimpse of her profile, she turned her hair to move to her seat. I caught a full view of her face when she gave me the feeling of butterflies in my stomach. It was Veronica. I hadn't seen her in such a long time. Josh and I progressively less of another after we snuck out of it too to my old house that night when we were ten. Usually when I visit them, she'd be out with her friends. While everyone stared at the screen, I stared at Veronica, only looking away when the feeling that I was being creeped came over me. But that feeling would go quickly subsided until my eyes would return to her. She really was beautiful, just like I thought that she would be as a kid. When the credits started to roll off to my friends got up and left, there was only one exit and they didn't want to be trapped in the waiting crowd for it to clear. I lingered in hopes of catching Veronica's attention. As she and her friends walked by, I took a glance. Hey, Veronica. She turned looking towards me, looking a bit startled. Yeah? I just got out of my seat and stepped a little into the light, coming in through the open door. It's me, Josh's old friend from way back. How have you been? Oh my god, hey, it's been so long. She motioned to her friends that she'd be out in a second. Yeah, just a few years at least. Not since the last time I stayed over with Josh. How is he? Oh, that's right. Remember all you guys still play Ninja Turtles with your friends? She laughed and I blushed a little. Heh, <laughs> no, I'm not a little kid anymore. Me and my friends play X-Men now. I was really hoping she laughed. She did. <laughs> You're cute. Do you want to see these movies every time? I was still reeling from what she said. Does she really think I'm cute? I, does she just mean I was funny? Does she really think I'm attractive? I suddenly realized that she had asked me a question, and my mind grasped at what it was. Yeah, I said too loudly. 
I try to anyway. How about you? I come here every now and then. My boyfriend doesn't like these movies, but we just broke up, so I plan on coming from now on. I was trying to be casual, but failed. Well, well, that's cool. Not that you guys broke up, but I just meant that you are able to come here more often. She laughed again. I tried to recover. So are you coming the week after next? They're supposed to show Day of the Dead. It's really cool. Yeah, I'll be here. She smiled as she was about to suggest that maybe we could sit together when she quickly closed the space between us and hugged me. It was really good seeing you, she said with her arms around me. I was trying to think of what to say when I realized the biggest problem was I had forgotten how to talk. Luckily, Ryan, who I could hear approaching from the hallway, came in and spoke for me. Dude, you like the movies over right? Let's get the fuck out of here. Oh, yeah. Veronica let go and said that she'd see me next time. She was played out by the room by the music Ryan was making with his mouth. I was furious, but dissipated as soon as I heard Veronica laughing out of the lobby. The Day of the Dead couldn't come out soon enough. Ryan's family was going out of town, so he wouldn't be able to drive us, and the other friends I was with that night didn't have cars. A couple of days before the movie, I asked my mom if she could take me, and she responded almost immediately by denying my request, but I persisted and she picked up in desperation in my voice. She asked me why I wanted to go so badly, since I had seen the movie before, and I hesitated because saying that I was hoping to see a girl there. She smiled and asked playfully if she knew the girl. I reluctantly told her it was Veronica. Her smile disappeared from her face and she coldly said no. I decided that I would call Veronica if she could just pick me up. I had no idea if she still lived at home, but it was worth a try. But then I realized that Josh might answer. I hadn't talked to him in almost three years, and if he answered, I obviously couldn't talk to his sister. I felt guilty for calling to speak with Veronica, not to Josh. I dismissed it quickly, feeling it. Josh hadn't called me in years, though, either. I picked up the phone and dialed the number that was still embedded in my muscle memory from having dialed it off those often years ago. It rang several times before someone picked it up. It wasn't Josh. It was a mixture of both relief and disappointment. I realized in that second that I really missed Josh. I would call after this weekend to talk to him, but it was my only chance if Veronica could or would take me and I asked her. The person told me that I dialed the wrong number. I repeated the number back to her and she confirmed and she said she might must have changed her number and I agreed. I apologized for this disturbance and hung up. I was quickly intense dead sad now because I couldn't contact Josh even if I wanted to. I felt this terrible for not having to remember and afraid that he might answer the phone and he had me being my very best friend. I realized that the only way I could be put back in the touch with him would be for Veronica. For now, not that I needed one. I had another reason to see her. I told my mom the day before I could go to the movies I was no longer concerned in going, but I was hoping if she could drop me off at my friend Chris's house. She reluctantly dropped me off on that Saturday, a couple of hours before the movie. My plan was to walk from his house to the feeder since he only lived about a half a mile away. They went to church early on Sunday, so his parents would sleep early Saturday night, and Chris was fine with not coming with me, since he had planned on chattering with the, this girl he met online. He said that he would walk back to his house, would be lonelier after she laughed when his face when I tried to kiss her, and I told him not to electrocute myself when he tried to have to go at it with his computer. I left his house at 11.15. I tried to pace myself so I could get there just a little bit before the movie. I was going on by myself, so I didn't want just to hang around there waiting. On the way to the feed here, I figured that if Veronica showed up at it, it would all be too lucky for us to arrive at the same time. I debated whether I should wait outside or just go in. Both had their pros and cons, and I was grappling with these concerns. I noticed that this steady of the steam looking and streaking car lights had been taken over and had been replaced with a single consistent spotlight refused to pass. The road wasn't illuminated by the street lights. 
So I was walking in the grass with the road about two feet to my left. I stepped a little more to my right when I cranked my neck over the left shoulder to see what was behind me. A car had stopped about ten feet behind me. All I could see were violently bright headlights that were cutting through otherwise stying surroundings. I thought that might be one of Chris's parents. Maybe because they came in to check on us and I hadn't seen while I was gone. It would have been taken for persisting for Chris to confess. I took one step towards the car and it broke the pause as it started driving down towards me at a slow pace. It had passed me and I just saw it wasn't Chris's parents' car or any other car I recognized for that matter. I tried to see at the car driver, but it was too dark and my pupils had shrunk down with the face blinding the lights from my car just moments before. They had adjusted enough so that I could see a tremendous crack in the back of the window as the car, it drove away. I didn't think much of the whole affair. Some people find it fun just to scare people. I often hide around when corners and then jumped out at my mom after all. I timed it right and got there about 10 minutes before the movie. I decided to wait outside until around 11.57, since that would give me time to find her inside if she was already seated. As I was considering the possibility that she might not show, I saw her. She was alone and she was beautiful. I waved to her and walked close to the distance. She smiled and I asked if my friends were already inside. I said that they weren't and realized that this must seem that I was trying to make this as a date. She didn't seem to be bothered by that nor that she was bothered when I handed her the ticket I had already bought. She looked at me puzzledly look and said, Don't worry, I'm rich. She laughs as she went inside. I bought us one popcorn and two drinks and spent most of the movie debating or whatever or not I should reach my hand into the popcorn bag when she reached in so they would touch. She seemed to be enjoying the movie and before I knew it, it was over. We didn't linger in the feed here because this was midnight and the show wouldn't loot her in the lobby, so we waited outside. The parking lot out of the feeder was huge because it connected with the mall that had gone out of business, not wanting the night to be over yet. I continued the conversation while cautiously walking towards the old mall. We were about out the corner and about to leave the feeder out of sight when I looked back and saw her car wasn't the only one left in the parking lot. The other one had a huge crack on the back of the window. My immediate uneasiness turned to understanding. That makes a lot of sense. The driver of that car works here and must have figured out why I was on my way to the movie. Injecting a real horror into my life and fan seemed to be an obvious move. We walked around the mall and about talked about the movie. I told her that I thought Day of the Dead was better than Dawn of the Dead, but she refused to agree. When I told her that I called her old number, and about my dilemma, who could answer the phone. She couldn't find it, it was funny as I did, but she took my phone and put her number in it, and she commented saying that it might be the worst cell phone she'd ever seen. Her evaluation wasn't re-signed when I told her that I couldn't receive pictures on it, so I called her so she would have my number and programmed into it. She told me that she was graduating, but she hadn't done well in school far along that year, so she wasn't sure if she even would get into college. I told her to attach a picture of herself to the application and they pay her to go there just to see if they could look at her. She didn't laugh at one and I thought that she might be offended. She might have thought I was implying that she couldn't get it based on her intelligence. I nervously glanced at her and she was just smiling and even though this poor light, I could see that she was blushing. I wanted to hold her hand but I couldn't. As we walked down the final side of the mall, back towards the feed here, I just asked her about Josh and she told me that she didn't want to talk about it. I asked her if he was at least doing okay and she said, I don't know. I figured Josh might have took a wrong turn somewhere, started getting into trouble. I felt bad. I felt guilty. As we approached the parking lot, I noticed that the car with the cracked back window was gone and that her car was now the only one in the parking lot. She asked me if I needed a ride, and even though I really didn't, I said that I appreciate it. I had my drunk hold my soda during the movie, and all the walking was putting pressure on my bladder. 
and I knew that I could wait until I was back at Chris's, but I decided that I was going to try and kiss her when she dropped me off, and I didn't want his biological nagging to rush through me out of the car. This would be my first kiss. I could think of no room, no rust us to conceal of what I needed to do. The feeder had lawn closed, so I only had one option. I told her that I was going to go behind the feeder deer to piss, but I'd be back in two shakes. It was obvious, though, that it was hilarious. She seemed to laugh now at how funny it was, than how funny it clearly was. On the way to onward to the feeder, I stopped and turned towards her, asked her if Josh ever told me that a kid named Alex had done something nice for me. She paused, trying to think of a moment that she had said. She inquired as to why, and I had to ask, but I said it was nothing. Josh really was a good friend. I went to the back of the feed here, realized that there was a chain-link fence fending off the rusting, running parallel of the walls of the building. Where I stood, I, she could see me, and the fence seemed to stretch endlessly, so I thought I could just hop it, duck out of sight, and return quickly as I could. I have been on it for too much effort, but I thought of it polite. I climbed the fence and walked just a little ways until I was right outside and urinated. For a moment, the only sounds were crickets of the grass behind me and the collusion of liquid and cement. These sounds were overpowered by a noise that I could still hear, even when it's quiet and even when there was no other noise to distract my ears. In the distance, I heard a faint screeching, which quickly subsided only to be replaced with a cascade of thundering vibrations. I quickly realized enough what it was. It was a car. The growling of the engine got louder, and I thought, no, not louder, closer. As soon as I realized, I started back towards the fence. But before I could get very far, all I heard is a brief, tarantrated scream. The roar of the engine terminated in a deafening thud. I started running, but only after two or three steps, I was tripped by a loose piece of stone and fell hard fast into the concrete, my head striking the corner of the chair as I fell. I dazed out so maybe 30 seconds, but the renewed rumbling of the engine drew my senses back and my, and my equilibrium was restored to my adrenaline. I was redoubled by my efforts. I was worried that whoever crashed the car might harass Veronica. As I was climbing over the fence, I saw that there was only one car in the parking lot. I didn't see any evidence of a crash, and I thought that I might have misjudged the direction or proximity. As I ran towards Veronica's car and as an orientated change, I saw what the car hit. My legs had stopped working almost completely. It was Veronica. Her car was sitting between us, and as I closed the distance and walked around, she came fully into view. Her body was twisted, crumpled up like a discarded figure, meant to represent a catalog of things a human body cannot do. I could see the bone of her right shin cutting through her jeans, and her left arm was wrapped around so hard at the back of her neck. Her hand had fell right on her breast. Her head was craned back and her mouth hung widely open towards the sky. There was so much blood. As I looked at her, I actually found that her this concern of whatever she was laying on her back or stomach, and this alpinical illusion made me feel sick. When you are confronted with something in the world that simply doesn't belong, your mind tries to convince itself that it's dreaming, and to the end of it, provides you with the distinct of sense of all things moving slowly, even through sap. In that moment, honestly, felt that I would wake up any moment, but I didn't wake up. I fumbled with my cell phone to call for help, but it had no signal. I could see Veronica's phone sticking out of what it looked like was her front right pocket. I had no choice, trembling. I reached for her phone as I slid out and moved to gasp for air, as violently as it seemed that she were trying to breathe in the whole world. This startled me so much as I staggered back, fell onto the absalt with her phone in hand. She was trying to adjust her body to get into its natural position. But with every spasm and jerk, I could hear the cracking and grinding of her bones. Without thinking, I scrambled over to her, and I put my face over hers and said, Veronica, don't move. Don't move, okay? Just stay still. Don't move, Veronica. Please just don't move. 
I kept saying the words as it fall apart as tears were streaming down my face. When I opened my phone, it still worked. It was still on the screen where she had saved my number. But when I saw it, I felt my heart break a little. I called 911 and waited with her, telling her that she was going to be okay and feeling guilty for lying with her every time I said it. When the sound of sirens went through the air, it seemed to become more alert. She had remained conscious since I found her, but now more of the light was coming back to her eyes. Her brain was still protecting her from the pain, though it looked as if she was finally allowing herself to become aware that something terribly was wrong with her. Her eyes rolled to mine and her lips moved. She was struggling, but I heard her he picture my picture. He took it. I couldn't understand what she meant, so I said the only thing I could do. I I'm so sorry, Veronica. I rode with her in the ambulance where she finally lost conscious, and I waited in the room and they had reserved for her. I still had her phone, so I put it in my in her purse and I called my mom for the hospital. It was around 4 a.m. I told her I was fine, but that Veronica was not. She cursed at me and said that she'd be right over there, but I told her I wasn't leaving until Veronica was out of surgery. She said she'd come anyway. My mom and I didn't speak much, though. I told her I was very sorry for lying, and she said that we would talk about it later, and I think we had just had more in that room. If I had just told her about boxes or that night with the raft, she would have just told me more of what she knew. I think of the things that would have changed, but I just sat there in silence. She told me that she loved me and that I could call her whenever I wanted her to come and get me. As I was leaving, Veronica's parents rushed in. Her dad and her mom exchanged a few words that appeared to be quite serious while Veronica's mother talked to the person at the desk. Her mother was a nurse but didn't quite work at this hospital and I'm pretty sure she tried to get Veronica transferred but her condition was prohibitive. While we waited, a police came in and talked to each of us. I told them what happened and they made some notes and then they left. She came out of surgery and 99% of her body was covered in a thick white cast. Her right arm was free, but the rest of her was bound like a cocoon. She was still under, but I remember how I felt when I had my cast on before kindergarten. I asked a nurse for a marker, but I couldn't think of anything to write. I slept in the chair in the corner and went home the next day. I came back that afternoon several days. At some point they had moved another patient into her room and set up a screen around Veronica's bed to act as a partolin. She didn't seem to be feeling much better, but she made movements of lucidity. But it seemed like in those periods where we barely would talk, her jaw had just been broken by the car, so the doctors had wired it shut, and I sat with her for a while. But there was nothing much I could say. I got up and walked over to her, I kissed her on the forehead, and she whispered, just through the clenched teeth, Josh. This surprised me a little bit, but I looked at her and said, He has not come yet to see you? No. I found myself really irritated. Even if Josh had gotten into trouble, he should still come and see his sister, I thought. I was about to express this when she said, No, Josh, he ran away. I should have told you. I felt my blood turn to ice. When? When did this happen? When he was 13. Did did he leave a note or something? On his pillow. She started crying as I followed her. But I think now we were crying for a different reason. Even if I didn't realize it. At this point there was a lot of things I don't remember about my childhood. There were a lot of connections I haven't yet made. I told her that I had to go. But she could text me anytime. I got a text from her the next day. Telling me not to come back. I asked her why and she said she didn't want to want me to see her like that again. I agreed brilliantly. We texted each other every day, although kept this from my mom because I knew she didn't like me talking to Veronica. Usually her texts were usually fairly short and mostly in responses more lengthy texts that I would send her. I tried calling her only once and this was sure was screening her calls, but I hoped that she could hear my voice. She picked it up but didn't say anything. I could hear now, labored breathing as she was. About a week after she told me not to come see her anymore, she sent me a text that simply read, I love you. 
I was filled with so many emotions, but I was responded with expressing the most prevalent one. I replied with, I love you too. She said that she wanted to be with me and that she couldn't wait until she see me again. She told me that she had been released and only convulsing at her house. These exchanges carry on for several weeks, but every time I asked to come see her, she would say soon. I kept insisting that the following week, she said that there might be she might be able to make it some to the next midnight movie. I couldn't believe it, but she insisted that I should try. I got a text from her that afternoon of the movie saying, see you tonight. I got Ryan to drive me to Chris's since Chris's parents found out what happened and that I wasn't welcome at their house anymore. I explained that to Ryan that she might be in bad shape, but that really I cared about was her to give us some space. He accepted that and we headed down there. Veronica didn't show. I saved a seat for her next to me near the exit so she can get in and out easily. About 10 minutes into the movie, Mance slid into his chair and I whispered, Excuse me, is this seat taken? But he didn't respond at all. He just stared ahead of the screen. I remember wanting to move because there was something wrong with the way he was breathing. I forfeited it because I realized that she wasn't coming. I texted her the next day asking if she was alright and I was inquired as to why she didn't show up at the previous night. She responded with that it would turn out to be the last message I received from her. She simply said, see you again soon. She was delirious and I was worried about her. I sent her several replies reminding her about the movie and saying it was no big deal, but she just stopped replying. I grew increasingly upset over the next several days. I couldn't reach her at home because I knew I didn't know that number, and I wasn't even sure where they lived. My mood became increasingly depressed, and my mother, who had been really nice as of late, asked me if I was okay. I told her that I haven't heard from Veronica in days and felt all the warmth of leave her disposition. What do you mean? She was supposed to meet me at the movies yesterday, and I know it's been like that just three weeks since she got hit, but she said she would try to come, and after that she just stopped talking to me altogether. She must hate me. She looked confused, and I could read on her face to what she was trying to say, tell of my mind, simply was broken. When she saw that I hadn't, or her eyes had began to water, she pulled me forward to her, embracing me. She was beginning to sob, but it didn't seem too much intense to a reaction to my problem. I had no reason to think she practically cared for Veronica. She drew in the shuddering breath and then said something to me that still makes me nauseous. Even now, she says, Veronica's dead, sweetheart. Oh, God, I thought you knew. She died on the last day you visit her. Oh, baby, she died weeks ago. She had completely broken down but I knew it it wasn't because of Veronica. I broke down the embrace, staggered backwards. My mind was swimming. This wasn't possible. I had just exchanged messages with her yesterday. I could only think of one question. It was probably the most trivial I could ask. Then why was her phone still on? She still continued sobbing. She didn't answer. And I exploded. Why did it take them so long to shut off her goddamn phone? Her crying broke enough to mutter. The pictures. I would later come to find out that her parents thought that her phone had been lost in the accident. Despite the fact that they had put it in her purse that night, she brought it to the hospital. When they retrieved her belongings, her phone was not among them. They have intended to try and contact the phone company at the end of the billing cycle to deactivate the line. But they received a call informing them of a passing and pleading charge of hundreds of pictures that was sent from her phone. Pictures. Pictures that were all sent to my phone. My pictures and I never got because my phone couldn't receive them. Vailene learned that they were all sent from the night before she died. They deactivate the phone immediately. I try not to think about the contents of those pictures, but I remember wondering for some reason whatever I could have been in any of them. My mouth went dry, and I felt the painful sting of despair as I thought of the last message I received from her phone. See you again soon. On the first day of kindergarten, my mother had elected to drive me to school. We were both nervous, 
and she wanted me to be there all the way up until the moment I walked into class. It took me a bit longer to get ready in the morning due to my still mending arm. The cast came up a couple inches past my elbow, which meant that I had to cover my entire arm with this specially designed latex bag Then, when I showered. The bag was built to tight around the opening in order to seal out any water that might otherwise destroy the cast. I could easily get the pinching of the bag itself. That morning, however, perhaps due to my excitement or nervousness, I hadn't pulled the strap right through enough, and halfway through the shower, I could feel the water pooling inside around the bag around my fingers. I jumped and tore the latex shield away. I could feel the previously rigid plaster had become soft and absorbing the water. Because there was no way effectively to clean the area between your body and a cast, the dead skin that would normally have fallen away merely sits there. When stirred by the moisture, like sweat, it emits an odor, and apparently this odor is proteinate, the amount of moisture induced. Because soon after I began attempting to dry it, I was struck by the powerful stench of rot. As I continued to frantically rub it with the towel, it began to disintegrate. I was growing increasingly distressed. I put as such much effort as a child would to his very first day of school. I had sat there with my mom picking out my clothes that night before. I had spent a great deal of time picking out my backpack, and I had become exceedingly excited to show everyone about my lunchbox. I had the Ninja Turtles on it. I had fallen into my mom's habit of calling these children. I haven't met yet my friends already. But as the condition on my cast worsened, I became deeply upset and thought though surely I wouldn't be able to apply the label to anyone by this time the day was over. Defeated, I showed it to my mom. It took 30 minutes to get moist, most of the moisture out while working to preserve the rest of the cast. To the address the problem of the smell, my mom cut shills, silvers off of a bar of soap, slid them down the cast, and then rubbed the remainder of the soap on the outside, attempt to cocoon the rancid smell inside to be more of a pleasant one. By the time we arrived at my school, my classmates were already engaged into their second activity, and I was shoehorned into the, one of the groups. I wasn't very clear on what the guidelines of the activities were, and were about in five minutes. I had violated the rules so badly that each member of my group complained to their teacher and asked why I was in their, had to be in their group. I had brought a marker to school in hopes that I could collect some signatures or drawings in my cast next to my mother's. I suddenly felt foolish for even having put in a marker in my pocket. Because of that morning, kindergartens had the lunchroom to themselves at my elementary school, but some of the tables were off limits, so I couldn't have to sit there alone. I was self-consciously picking at the fraying ends of my cast when a kid sat across from me. I like your lunchbox, he said. I could tell he was making fun of me, and I really grew angry. In my mind, the lunchbox was the last good thing about my day. I didn't even look up at my arm. I felt the burning in my eyes and tears that I was holding back. I looked up to tell the kid to leave me alone, but before I could get the words out, I saw something that made me pause. He had the exact same lunchbox as me. I laughed. <laughs> I like your lunchbox too. I think Michelangelo's the coolest, he said. Mimicking Munchuck moves. I was in the middle of rebutting by saying that Raphael was my favorite when he knocked his carton of milk off the table and onto his lap. I then tried to stifle my laughter as I didn't know him much at all. Put all the struggling off my face. He must have struck him as funny because he started laughing. Suddenly, I didn't feel so bad about my cast. I just thought that the person would hardly notice me anyway. Just then I thought I would try my luck. Hey, do you want to sign my cast? As I pulled out the marker, he asked me how I broke it, and I told him I fell off the tallest tree in my neighborhood. He seemed impressed. I watched him laboriously draw his name, and when he was done, I asked him what it said. He told me it said Josh. Josh and I had lunch together every day, and whenever we would partner up in projects, I helped him with handwriting, and he took the blame when I wrote fart on the whale of the permanent marker. I would welcome and know the other kids, but I think even then it was just Josh was my only real friend. Moving a friendship outside of school, 
when you're five years old is definitely actually more difficult than you remember. The day we launched our balloons, we had such a good time and I asked Josh if he wanted to come to my house the next day to play. He said that he did and that he would bring some of his toys. I said that we could go exploring and maybe go swim at the lake when I got home. I asked my mom and she said it would be fine. My enthusiasm was the boundless until I realized I had no way of contacting Josh to tell him. I spent the whole weekend worrying about our friendship would dissolve by Monday. When I saw him after the weekend, I was relieved to find that he had run into the same obstacle thought it was funny. Later that week, we both remembered to write down our phone numbers at home and then exchange them to the school. My mom spoke with Josh's dad and it was dedicated that my mom would pick up Josh and myself home from school that Friday. We alternated the basic structure nearly every weekend, so the fact that we lived so close made things much easier on our parents who seemed to work constantly.